Well, I'm pleased to be joined by one Maura Kremen. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago, and she researches organized crime, criminal violence, criminal law, and was a 2021-2022 uh, Fulbright Scholar in Palermo, Sicily. And we're here to discuss her latest article on Quillette, titled Honorable Men about the fight against uh, organized crime in Sicily. How are you today, Mara? Uh, it's great of you to join the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, get straight into the uh, uh, discussion, the topic of our discussion today. And uh, I should like to begin by asking you about your fact-fighting methods, as well as, say, your encounters with I guess, the people who were involved in this uh, fight. Sure. So um, I guess for a little bit of background, the article that I wrote for Quillette stemmed in large part from my experience doing field work for my dissertation. Um, my dissertation looked at the origins of anti-organized crime institutions from a political perspective. So in the course of doing that research for the dissertation, um, my, my methodology is primarily qualitative. I did a lot of archival research, um, uh, primarily in Rome, actually a few years ago, trying to kind of um, look through government records and get a sense of what the conversation was surrounding the adoption of Italy's um, primary anti-organized crime law enforcement institute laws and law enforcement bodies. Um, and then also looking a lot at public newspapers, uh, archive sources to get a sense of how people spoke about these issues, how people at the time, politicians and activists and ordinary people were thinking about the scale and scope of the mafia problem and the solutions that could be um, put forward to, to address that. And then in Sicily itself, I was uh, lucky enough to have the opportunity uh, to speak with people who are actively engaged or have historically been actively engaged in the fight against organized crime. Um, again, I primarily worked in Sicily, but I did also speak with people in other in other regions as well, in Rome and other parts of Southern Italy. Um, so I would speak, for instance, with prosecutors, with activists, um, sometimes with legal academics as well to get their perspectives on what the sort of landscape of anti-organized crime law and legal institutions and sort of the cultural landscape had looked like in the sort of early 1980s and 1990s and how that's shifted over time. So that was the, the research end of it. Um, in addition, I was living in Palermo as a Fulbright Scholar from October uh, 2021 to May of uh, this year, 22. And so I was just sort of in the community. I became involved with the group Adio Pizzo, which is an anti-extortion group um, based in Palermo. And so I had the opportunity to get to know that organization and its members a little bit more closely and see some of the work um, up close that they do in terms of trying to build anti-mafia cultures and give people concrete tools to resist extortion. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, uh, so tell me about how your, I guess, your personal background led you to an interest in uh, this uh, particular topic. Sure. So it's been a, a sort of convergence of a couple of, of different fronts. So I, my academic background primarily um, in my undergraduate and, and my master's program was in the study of political violence. So I did work on terrorism, um, insurgency, civil war, that kind of thing, but primarily nationalist terrorist movements. Um, I took actually took a class in my second year of my PhD student on uh, of my PhD studies on criminal politics and the politics of criminal violence, which has a lot in common with with terrorist violence. So overlapped a, a bit with my interests at the time. Um, but as I was at the uh, at the same time, also pursuing a law degree really triggered some interest on my end um, in terms of the sort of intersection of this of, the, of this violence, um, sort of violent politics and the criminal justice system. So that was one sort of professional academic end. 
in the course of taking that class, I actually started to read and research for my final paper on the Italian mafia. I have my own background um, had led me to be interested in that case study in particular. I am Italian American. I grew up on a, uh, a family that had a pretty strong sense of Italian cultural identity. I had studied Italian in school. I'd studied in Italy. So I was familiar with the Italian context and was really interested to see how some of that kind of theoretical framework would apply looking at, at this uh, sort of iconic case study of resistance to organized crime in Italy. And I found that actually exploring that case study was inspiring beyond the level of just that class paper, but really it was the the story of what had happened in Italy, the story of Falcone and Borsellino mm -hmm. really kind of made me want to go further with that topic, made me want to commit to it, made me see a way in which my own personal background, my own um, cultural experiences intersected with an academic project that was already something that I had a, a baseline interest and familiarity with. And so that yeah. was pretty much the part. Yeah, um, of course, uh, we are, I'm assuming you are as well, we are both very fortunate people in that we don't have firsthand experience with the mob, uh, as they call it, you know, um, neither in the Italian uh, context or the American context. So, I mean, I first learned of the mafia through uh, Hollywood movies, you know, which mm. have been really popular these days, The Godfather and Goodfellas and such. And I remember in the age of 12 or 13, I had a book that recounts some of the more famous uh, mobsters that made it to America, like uh, Lucky Luciano or... Uh, uh, Bugsy Siegel, um, mm. um, and so obviously no, you know, no firsthand direct experience with them. But um, what what I find out about them, the mafia, is that they are primarily Sicilian, and I think you have to be Sicilian in order to get made, as in you know, made into a an official member of uh, the hierarchy. And what I, from what I've read, uh, Sicilians tend to see themselves as very different from, I guess, what you would call mainland Italians, because Sicily is an island and all. So would that be an accurate observation? So a couple of different things um, in, that, in that observation. Um, so first of all, we in the US, those of us who tend to learn about the mafia from film and from sort of pop culture, um, do tend to have this idea about the sort of rigid ethnic basis of one Sicilian mafia. Uh -huh. uh, it's not exactly, the, the, there's actually a sort of broader definition of what the term mafia means. Um, in Italy, it's actually a technical legal term um, that you is encoded in Italian law, and it encompasses a number of different groups. So a mafia under Italian law is defined less by its ethnic roots or less or regional roots in the Italian context than it is by a specific pattern of criminal behavior in which it engages. So it's not just a group of a group that engages in criminal activity, but it's specifically a group um, that rules by intimidation, is able to subjugate, socially control the territory over which it has power and has uh, uses the law of silence, what's sometimes called omerta, yeah. um, which you've probably heard from from movies as well. So in Italy, there are really three historically very large mafia groups. The Sicilian group Cosa Nostra, uh, which is the most famous historically, but no longer the strongest. Um, the Neapolitan Camorra and the uh, Calabrian Andrangheta. So it's not just a Sicilian phenomenon. Um, there are also groups now in, in Puglia. The Sacra Corona Unita is a, probably the most famous Puglian, uh, Pugliese group. Um, but mafia groups have been identified outside of southern Italy, moving north as well. Um, so in Italy, there always remains the possibility for a group, uh, for a criminal organization, if it meets the legal definition to be qualified as a mafia, even if it's not southern Italian. Um, different mafia groups have different rules for recruitment. So for instance, the Indrangheta, in, uh, the Calabrian group you have to be born into it. Um, you can't be recruited. You can't, um, you know, just join. You have to actually be a member of an Indrangheta family to enter into the Indrangheta. This is not the case for the Camorra. It's not the case for uh, Cosa Nostra, both of which will recruit from outside. 
the ethnic component in terms of Sicilians only that you tend to hear that come up with the American mafia a bit more. Um, the rules, I think, are somewhat disputed to what degree you have to be Sicilian. Can you be half Sicilian? Can you be part Neapolitan? Um, you know, for instance, Al Capone, probably the most famous mobster um, in the United States, was of Neapolitan descent. He wasn't Sicilian. So I don't think these rules are quite as hard as hard and fast, although I don't um, know quite as much about the recruiting system in the U.S. But in Sicily, that's that's or in, in Italy, that's how it works. Um, to your second point, though, about Sicilian cultural identity. So Italy in general, as I, I, I'm sure you know, is a relatively young country. It's a country um, that only unified in the 1860s. Uh, it's instead most of Italian sort of cultural development over the last many, many hundred years has been highly regional. Um, Italy was governed by different you know, principalities, city states uh, existed under the control of empires at various points. And so you see throughout the country, very, very strong regional identities. Um, and that's certainly true in Sicily. In Sicily, you have a very strong sense of Sicilian identity. Um, you're absolutely right to point to the island uh, nature of Sicily. Uh, that will always give you a certain sense of separation. It's also uh, a territory that's lived under the control of a number of different empires over time. It hasn't, you know, it's under Arab control, Norman control, uh, points Greeks were there. So it's, it's you know, been invaded. It's been a sort of center point um, of cultural mixing throughout the Mediterranean for thousands of years. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out is that it's got a very old and well-established language that's distinct from Italian. So the Sicilian dialect is effectively, it, it, I'm not a linguist, I don't want to like make linguistic mm -hmm. um, determinations here, but it is uh, basically a separate language. For instance, I speak Italian, uh, I, I don't speak Sicilian. I can't understand necessarily somebody who's speaking Italian. I can get a word here and there. There are similarities. There's overlap. I know, you know, I know words that friends have taught me. Um, but if somebody is speaking in, in Sicilian, I won't understand them. And an Italian from Florence won't necessarily understand them. So those linguistic differences also come into play. But um, yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely correct to point to strong regional identification uh, sense of being Sicilian as something uh, distinct from just being Italian. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, you know, from what, from my reading of history, I know that, um, you know, the mafia tend to be against uh, fascism because uh, Mussolini was uh, crafting an Italian uh, identity and the Sicilians, since of, because of their adherence to their own ethnicity, was opposed to it. And, um, you know, again, this is from my uh, pop culture informed knowledge of the mob. Um, I, I see that from watching, you know, Godfather movies that they have a very strong um, uh, tribal inclination as well as uh, a strong culture of honor. And uh, I'm, from what I understand, the the reason why uh, the Italian the Italian mob uh, flourish in the U.S. of A. is that Italians tend to be discriminated against by the mainstream partisan Americans, and therefore they develop a deep distrust in the authorities, uh, the authorities, particularly the police, and therefore the mafia was created in order to, I guess, to represent or to uh, or to, I guess, um, to meet their the needs of uh, those living in Little Italy. Uh, that is most represented by the scene in the beginning of The Godfather, where uh, Mr. Bonacera was uh, complaining to uh, the Don. And <clears throat> um, I, I hope to uh, ask you if this is an accurate representation of what the mob is really like, and if that. If that is so, uh, how how and why is the mafia flourishing in or did flourish in Italy? I that's where they are from. So you know. Sure. So, lot there again um, to to kind of pack kind of unpack a bit. Um, so to, I guess 
maybe it will be useful if I give a bit of a sense of, of the history of where the Sicilian mafia came from. Mm -hmm. So we actually don't know for sure definitively what the origins of the mafia groups are. There's some contested history. There's a lot of um, myth making around the origins of these criminal groups, often done by the groups themselves. They actually sort of have their own forms of propaganda and telling legends about their their origins, um, most of which involve them being sort of, you know, thousand year old Robin Hood type figures protecting the people. Um, but the the probably the the best guess we can have or the 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 best um theories that we have going about the origins of the mafia and best explanations is that they go back to in Sicily at least uh roughly around the time of Italian unification so um mid 19th century and the thing you sort of have to understand is that in the process of unifying or in the in the um, period leading up to unification there was a massive land redistribution. Um, Sicily had existed under the control of these major um, noble landholders and their properties were broken up. They were uh, redistributed to smaller landholders. But in the process of doing this, as you can imagine, with any sort of massive land redistribution, you have disputes, you have uh, unclear boundaries, people are going to fight over exactly whose property goes where, who gets access to the best, you know, land holding the, you know, best region for growing crops or um, for livestock, what have you. At the same time, when you have unification, the actual island of Sicily is no longer fully governed the, the the as the new country is forming itself sicily sort of gets a little bit of short shrift on law enforcement is massively under policed historically the nobles who had controlled the island would have had their own private armies to maintain their land but once it's redistributed that's gone so what do you do you have this conflict situation where people are looking to protect their newfound holdings they're looking to settle disputes you have essentially anarchy on the island. You have bandits roaming around who pose an actual legitimate threat. And so what these new landholders did is they organized groups of sort of local strongmen who would come together and offer essentially privatized protection from these various threats. And what happens over time is that those strong sort of strongman groups develop an increasing sense of social power, especially given the fact that you don't have an effective system of local governance. This becomes the local governance. This becomes who people turn to in times of need, turn to, to resolve their problems. But to sustain themselves, especially as the sort of security situation becomes better, these people still have to have, there still has to be some sort of demand for these sort of private protection rackets, if you will. Once um, you have more law enforcement, enforcement once you have um the arrival of or, or sorry the the elimination of bandits and so eventually they themselves the mobsters themselves become the source of the threat that they promise to protect you against um and so they create the demand for their own continued existence and this becomes sort of entrenched in the system people will treat the local mafia boss as the local essentially political leader so you mentioned fascism, right? Yeah. And you're you're right that Mussolini, one of Mussolini's goals uh, when he rose to power was to effectively unify the Italian state to make it one single uh, functional nationalist state centralized around Rome. And the fact that you had these sort of localized power structures in Sicily was a threat to that. And so Mussolini was determined to, to combat the mafia. He sent a man by the name of Cesare Mori down to Sicily to absolutely repress the mafia. And it, he, Mori was uh, brutally effective or almost effective. He probably did as much as anybody to begin to actually stamp out the mafia. Um, now, his methods were not anything that you'd want to see repeated, but um, they did reduce the power of the mafia for a time. But then, of course, Benito Mussolini was overthrown and uh, the mafia returned to power and um, in large part because they were released from prison when the Allies invaded Sicily. Um, so that's sort of the origin of where the mafia power base comes from at a sort of local level in Sicily.
Now, that only gets you through World War II. At that point, the mafia is really kind of a, a rural phenomenon based on local power controls, extortion, resource controls over things like agriculture, land, water, that sort of thing. Over time, they would become more tied in with the state, more connected to local politicians, um, main political parties. They would become more of an urban phenomenon. They would become involved in the construction industry, particularly in Palermo, which became a major money earner. And then over time, especially in the late 1960s, early 1970s, they really got involved in the drug industry, which is when their profits took off. So that's sort of the trajectory of what their uh, economic and power base looks like in Sicily. It's a little different in the United States, um, but I would say that uh, your analysis of what sort of the, the, the crime power base in neighborhoods look like is, um, is pretty accurate where you have these sort of um, certain immigrant neighborhoods where you can imagine everyone's coming from the same region, they speak the same language, they um, are, you know, do develop their own networks of power within their neighborhoods. I guess the one thing I would, I guess, caution against in terms of thinking about how accurate movies like The Godfather are in terms of their representation of what this looked like. So for instance, the scene with Bonacera, I, uh, that at the opening of The Godfather, um, is quite poignant, right? Like you have this man who's tried to live the American dream, tried to live honestly, and the system has failed him in some sense. The police are not uh, willing to take seriously his accusation that his uh, his daughter has been raped. They're not willing to go after the young men who, who victimized his daughter. So he turns to the local mob boss. Um, but of course, in doing so, he becomes indebted to Vito Corleone and is now going to be effectively required to do whatever Corleone wants. Um, and in the movie, all we see is Bonacera being asked to do the relatively um, easy task, easy in this morally, in this of uh, sort of healing Sonny Corleone's body, sort of making him presentable so that after he's been massacred, by his enemies, he will, at least at his wake, his mother won't have to see him like that. And that's not a particularly morally compromising request for Bonacera, but that's not necessarily the case. The um, local person who goes into debt to the mafia is going to be in debt for a long time. They're going to either be giving up their earnings, they're going to be asked to make compromises continuously, and they've essentially uh, will become subjugated to this sub-state power that they have to exist under uh, within their community. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I know for certain that the depictions of the mafia in the Godfather movies, as well as uh, Goodfellas, are somewhat fictional. And I was uh, looking to, I guess, compare and contrast that to what your research shows. So I got that. So perfect. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, politics of uh, of the, the mafia and how they get involved in, I guess, local and national Italian politics because that's something that I'm going to ask. Um, you know, I I do I do hear that um, you know many prominent uh, Italian politicians were, I guess, uh, mob connected. There's a very famous uh, Italian prime minister, uh, Giulio. Andre Oti, Andre Oti, yeah, Julio Andre Oti, who was a uh, you know who was alleged to be connected with them, the organized criminal elements of Italy, and so. But I do wonder, since uh, we are both uh, interested in political science, um, how does the the mafia, and I'm guessing is different across the the Italian organizations, uh, organize themselves politically, and to what extent? Do they involve themselves in the, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, elected democratic uh, Italian politics? Yeah, so this is always um, an ongoing concern with this group. So I'll, you're absolutely right to bring up Andreotti. This, he's sort of the quintessential figure for talking about the history of the mafia's connection in politics. Um, so historically, Cosa Nostra at least, tended to um, be available to procure votes. So this was 
part of where they were able to secure so much of their power and uh, essentially their impunity from the law was because the, one of their uh, economically profitable activities was the procurement of votes for certain political leaders. And for most of the post-World War II period, Cosa Nostra at least tended to procure votes for representatives within the Christian Democrat Party, uh, Democrazia Cristiana, which was the sort of centrist bloc that dominated Italian politics uh, after World War II. And Andreotti was probably the most important figure within the Christian Democrats. Now, it was not the case that the entire Christian Democrat Party was in the bed of the mafia. You will hear that accusation thrown out. It, it that would be giving that would be making it too too big. The way it would work was that the mafia would be able to mobilize enough votes um, in Sicily, in and around Palermo, to be able to make sure that Sicily would consistently be delivered for the Christian Democrats and for a politician like Andreotti, who had considered the South to be a major political base. Being able to regularly secure those votes were something that he depended on. Um, for the mafia, then they could basically have the guarantee that they had protectors at the highest levels um, of the most powerful party. So you didn't have to corrupt the entire party. You didn't have to corrupt even the majority. You just sort of had to be able to influence the right people. Mm. And that was enough. So Andreotti, like it, it's it's difficult to say the extent of his involvement, but it there were court cases actually documenting the fact that he had connections with the mafia. He the statute of limitations had run out to prosecute him on some of them, but um, he was found to have had associations with members of Cosa Nostra. Um, again, you know, to speak about exactly what the nature of these connections are now is you know, is, is difficult and I, not something you want to speculate about loosely, but it is the case that local governments have consistently um, been found to have been infiltrated by mafia organizations that continues to be a problem. So one of the things you can do within the Italian government is you can, if a local municipality is suspected of having uh, been infiltrated by and corrupted by a mafia group, investigations can be launched. And if it's found that it has in fact been, that the that the uh, city government has in fact been corrupted by the mafia, um, the actual government can be dissolved by the national um, administrative bodies that are responsible for this. So we actually have documentation of local governments. You can look this up online. You can find records of all of the local governments that have been corrupted by um, various mafia groups, not just the Sicilians, but throughout Italy. Um, so that is one way of documenting continued political presence, um, but also economic presence, the connection of mafia groups with large corporations and businesses, their ability to um, earn significant amounts of money makes it very difficult to sort of police them, uh, given the scale of their power as well. Yeah. Um... Thank you. And the second part of that question is, how do uh, these mafia organizations organize themselves uh, politically? And um, I'm assuming it has some similarities to, I guess, uh, principalities in Italy, uh, in the old Italy, especially as described by uh, Machiavelli. Um, and I'm I'm assuming it has to do with how violence is exercised uh, both internally and externally uh, mm -hmm. by these um, you know mob heads. So yeah, so here that would be my question. So you're you're asking specifically about the organization of the mafia groups themselves, the internal. Uh, yeah. How do they organize themselves politically? Yeah. So it varies from group to group. Um, Cosa Nostra historically tended to be more hierarchical. They tended to have a fairly rigid structure um, in which you had um, individual soldiers who would work within a, within a family. There was a head of the family who would govern that who would govern that small group. Then you would have the sort of what they would call a district or mandamento, which would be a group of I want to say ten families. I could be wrong on that. Uh, I might be misremembering the number, but you would have a district which would be a certain number of families, which would be governed by a capo mandamento, the head of the district, 
And then this would kind of continue through the island until you got to what was known as the cupola, the, the dome, the governing body of the entire organization. So this is the sort of famous pyramid structure of the Sicilian mafia. Now, a structure like that has certain advantages, right? The, the big one is discipline. You have the ability to control violence at the top level to make sure that, for instance, any the murder of, of, of the head of a family by another member of Cosa Nostra had to be approved by the cupola. So you can imagine this disciplines violence. You are not going to get, theoretically, you're not going to get massive amounts of violence. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, that structure bro broke down when you had one particular group that wanted to take over control of the entire organization. They were actually able to effectively launch a coup against, um, against the commission. So the disadvantage of that kind of hierarchical structure is that you have a sort of easy target, right? Like you can, if you can get the top levels, you can really do damage to the organization. And since Cosa Nostra gained so much attention for the violence that was launched in the 80s and 90s, it really was a focal point of repression. And that structure made it easier to crack down in certain senses. Now, the Camorra, by, by contrast, is much more disparate, much more cellular. Um, families are separated. There is not historically been this sort of overarching governing body. Um, and that has made them, on the one hand, less disciplined. Violence tends to be less regulated in Camorra um, controlled areas, but also much harder to dismantle. Um, the Andrangheta is a bit different. They are something of a combination, you do have these sort of disparate families where the cohesiveness of the Indrangheta and the real discipline of this group comes in is this, again, the blood ties, the fact that you have immense loyalty within Indrangheta families because everybody's related to each other. So it makes it much less likely that you'll get, for instance, people collaborating with the government, um, turning state's witness, um, and fewer feuds within families. They do happen. They, there are definitely Indrangheta feuds and they can be quite bloody. Um, but a lot of the sort of policing takes place within the sort of, within this family structure. So they're not quite as hierarchical as the Sicilians were, um, but also not quite as cellular as the Camorra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, again, like I said, I, I'm guessing it has to do with how violence is dispensed. Uh, and I was wondering on how I get the the cause or the justification for uh for the mob to exercise violence and you know according to your collect piece uh there's a misconception that uh the the mafia are bound by an honor code not to kill women and children and then you find out once you reach corleone the town that there were uh adolescents and children who were murdered and often in very brutal ways so um, yeah, so how how does how do they uh, justify their use of violence? So yeah, it's a great point that you that you bring up. There has long been this myth that the mafia the mafia abides by a code of honor. They don't kill women and children. Um, they use the term to describe themselves, men of honor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually, for, for, for me, it's one of my biggest, I guess, um, quibbles, if you will, uh, with a lot of the mafia movies that exist in Hollywood is that I think they tend to downplay the degree to which Cosa Nostra is willing to engage in violence against women, children, innocents, if you will. So justifications, again, as with everything, it sort of depends on context. Um, typically you wouldn't have seen the sort of highly public um, killings of targeted female and child victims by Cosa Nostra historically as you did during the 80s and 90s. When the Corleone clan emerged, they were violent on a scale unprecedented in Sicilian history. I mean, the mafia has a long history. It has subjugated and repressed people in Sicily for decades, but that degree of massive, visible public violence was unusual. In some cases, uh, gender, for instance, can um, 
sort of present its own justification. So there's um, great work by Alex Perry, who talks about the use of violence against women in the Indrangheta, um, the, for instance, use of honor killings, uh, the use of violence to police women's behavior, um, to prevent women from um, leaving the group or from engaging in any behavior that is deemed to be morally unacceptable. The Indrangheta does have certain codes of sexual morality um, that can be quite rigid. Um, this was actually also true of Cosa Nostra, though not to quite this, I don't believe to quite the same degree as it was with the Indrangheta. In the Camorra, you would, um, you know, occasionally see the targeting of young women as well. I will say that those killings tend to evoke more outrage. Um, for instance, if you kill a young man unfortunately, even if he's not associated with the group, sometimes there's the implication that he might have in some way been involved, um, which is not necessarily fair because innocent young men get um, get tainted not only with violence, but with their, their names being destroyed by that. But the killing of women and children does tend to evoke a lot of outrage. So there is a need to, I think, on the part of the groups, be somewhat careful about when they do it. However, they do do it. And depending on the way in which it happens. It might be justified as a sort of behavior regulation, again, like the Indrangheta cases that I was mentioning, or in the Sicilian cases, in um, particularly in these violent years, like the 80s and 90s, it was just sort of collateral damage, um, the effects of the mafia's war against the state. Right. So I don't think there was a specific effort to justify killing women and children per se on the part of the mafia but they were engaged in such unprecedented levels of violence at that time. It was just part of what came with that. Mm -hmm. So that neatly brings us to uh, the heroes of the piece, uh, particularly Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino. I guess, I hope I pronounced those names correctly. And they are law enforcers who have made it their you know, primary duty to pursue <clears throat> these uh criminal organizations and um, you know, unfortunately and perhaps inevitably violence was visited upon them uh, in the year 1992. So um, yeah, tell us more about you know, uh, the, I guess, the legal background of these two individuals and, and how violence was visited upon them. Sure, sure. So yeah, so Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino were two um, investigative judges operating in Sicily in the 80s and 90s. Um, so just so that I can be sort of uh, clear for people who don't, who come from a common law background like, like I do, their role at the time as investigative judges would have looked somewhat closer to what for instance, American or British or Canadian audiences would probably recognize more as a prosecutor um, than, a, than as a judge per se, but their titles were judges. They were um, within the Italian system, they were part of the judiciary. Um, so they were both born and raised in Palermo in the Calza neighborhood, uh, grew up in Palermo, went to the University of Palermo for law school and entered into the judiciary. Um, where they worked on mafia cases while they were uh, young, young judges, and were eventually moved into a sort of specialized unit that was developed by a man, a judge by the name of Rocco Chinici, who was a prosecutor within, or a judge um, within the Palermo uh, Tribunal. And Kenichi's idea was to develop a small unit of, of, of investigative judges who would focus solely on investigating mafia cases. And the idea of this was twofold. First, you wanted to have people who were highly knowledgeable about the mafia, who were specialized and dedicated all of their time and resources to the fighting this organization. But you also wanted to have a group that knew about each other's cases so that the mafia couldn't just pick off whatever investigator was going after them and kill his case. You wanted them to be able to share information among each other. And this was a tactic that had been used in fighting um, communist terrorist groups in the 1970s that had similar pools. So that's where that's the genesis for this um, structure came from. And so Falcone and Borsellino, along with a number of other judges were part of this pool. 
And they were responsible for trying to build a case against the mafia that would allow for the prosecution of the entire organization uh, as a whole, or as close as possible to the entire organization. So two things that Falcone and Borsellino did, one, one major contribution is they helped to, uh, they helped a politician, the head of the Communist Party in Italy at the time, a man by the name of Pio La Torre, they helped him to write the uh, law that would eventually criminalize membership in the mafia. Pio La Torre was actually killed for um, his role in submitting this law. But the law eventually passed following the, um, the murder of another very famous um, police officer in Sicily. Um, and when the law was passed, it made it a crime to be a member of the mafia. So with a law like that, judges like Falcone and Borsellino were able to actually bring charges and indictments against all members of the mafia, at least in theory. The problem was that legally you had to prove that people had the connections mm -hmm. um, that actually made them members of the mafia. So Falcone in particular was noteworthy for what's known as sometimes the Falcone method, or the follow the money method. He built strong financial cases. He would trace monetary connections among different mafiosi to show disparities in income and to show that people were connected by their financial transactions. The people who maybe could deny that they had some connection with the mafia, you could actually prove through finance, uh, through financial transactions that they did in fact have these connections. Um, so that technique was really important for building a massive case against the structure of the organization. The other thing that was really important was that they were able to secure the cooperation of a very high level mafia boss, a man by the name of Tommaso Buscetta, who had been a prominent member of Cosa Nostra operating primarily out of Brazil. His family had been slaughtered by members of the Corleonese crime uh, faction. The Corleonese, again, were the group that had launched this sort of massive coup within the mafia, had begun this wave of violence, started killing members of the government. So they were this, this very unusually violent faction. And to eventually go after the Corleonese, Buscetta did not think he had the resources to actually fight them on the ground. So instead he fought them in the courts. He was the first boss to collaborate with the state and to give testimony about the existence and structure of Cosa Nostra. And this allowed the prosecutors, Falcone, um, Borsellino and the anti-mafia pool to actually bring indictments against um, almost 400 members of the mafia uh, in court in a single massive trial that lasted almost two years. Mm -hmm. um, and the testimony of Buscetta was sufficiently convincing that the court actually accepted at all levels of appeal this theory of the mafia as a single unitary organization that could be criminalized through the law that Falcone and Borsellino and Pio da Torre had advocated for. Now, that trial lasted several years through the, the appellate process. It was uh, finally affirmed, the convictions were affirmed in 1991. At the same, as all of this was going on, Falcone was um, unable to advance in the judiciary in the way that he hoped, but he started to uh, he was actually recruited by the Minister of Justice to come work in Rome to try and start building new anti-mafia legal uh, and law enforcement institutions. So he moved to Rome and was starting to really build an infrastructure to go after the mafia there, kind of using the political capital that had been secured from the victories in this, this big trial, but also the ongoing violence that the, the mafia was still, they were still continuing to kill high level politicians, police officers, judges. So there was still this sense of national outrage about the victimization that Cosa Nostra was causing. So this made Falcone a sort of ongoing threat to the mafia. And in response, when Falcone returned from Rome to Palermo for a visit, um, as he was driving from the Punta Raisi airport, the Palermo airport, into the city, mafiosi had planted um, an enormous quantity of explosives under the main highway. And you have to understand, this is the main highway. It's to this day the main highway from the airport to Palermo. You have to drive it to get there. Um, so this was extremely dangerous, not just for Falcone and his escort, but to anyone who happened to be in the area. And they exploded this entire highway. Um, killing Falcone, his wife, and the members of his police escort. Now, Borsellino was very closely linked with Falcone his whole life, and it was widely assumed that he would be taking over, bearing the mantle of Falcone, becoming the next great anti-mafia leader. 
And so that made him also the next inevitable target. So less than two months later, two car bombs were placed outside of Borsellino's mother's home uh, in the city of Palermo. When he went to go visit her, those were both detonated and he and the members of his police escort were killed in July of 1992. So less than two months later. Yeah, and of course, uh, you um, you wrote that their death, uh, their, I guess, perhaps uh, martyrdom for the anti-mafia cause has um, perhaps rejuvenated the cause. And and ever since then, um, the mafia, the anti-mafia cause has uh, gained significant success. And, uh, you know, I'm, I would refrain from, you know, commenting on the legal aspects of the the fight because uh, I'm not in the legal background, but um, but I'm interested in popular culture and uh, you know to compare and contrast. Uh, you know, you you and I both have uh, issues with uh, Hollywood movies, American films, uh, portraying the mafia in a sort of romantic anti-hero light. I mean, the only the only anti-mafia movie that was that gained significant traction was a. Uh, the Untouchables by uh, Brian De Palma, mm-hmm. but um, ever since uh, the passing of uh, Falcone and Borsellino, there have been films made in Italy in the Italian language, where about people who stood up against the mob, um, you know, legally and you know, personally. Um, mm-hmm. And so I wonder, um, I, I do wonder about you know, since you are living in America, how. How come this uh, perhaps romantic, even overtly romantic uh, portrayal of the mob in uh, in American films and even hip hop music too? uh, Yeah, how come that? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and I think it would take me another three hours to go through it. I could probably talk about that, that question alone for days. Um, I, but I think if I had to boil it down to some key points, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Americans haven't lived victimization of the mafia in the same way that Italians have. We didn't see national heroes being killed. We didn't, even see quite the same victimization, public victimization, um, sort of overt violence against innocent victims in the same way that they did in Italy. So we, the American mafia didn't, you didn't see quite as much public uh, killing of police officials, of government, uh, of government officials, of again, women and children. And so that doesn't mean the innocent weren't victimized in the United States. So when um, Obster comes and tries to extort a local business owner to give up part of his money, they take food from the mouths of that man's children. If the members of the mafia kill somebody who owes you know, gambling debts or, or something like that, or beat somebody who owes gambling debts, you victimize that person and you victimized his family, the people who depend on him. But that's not something the public sees. It's not something the public has to experience the grief and the loss of. Falcone and Borsellino were national heroes in Italy. Um, people like Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa, who was the, the Carabinieri general who was killed in 1982. Uh, these were figures of enormous stature. It would be, you know, like the killing of, uh, you know, pick your fate. I, I don't want to get political, but pick your, you know, whatever sort of national unifying figure you want to, you know, come to mind. Um, this was a, sort of a stab to the heart of a lot of people in Italy. I guess what I heard a lot when I was there was people who would compare the murders of Falcone and Borsellino to something like the assassination of John F. Kennedy in the sense that it was something that shocked Everybody, everybody remembered where they were when it happened. Everybody had their story of how they found out Falcone and Borsellino died. And I think when you've had that experience, it's much harder to romanticize when you have lived that kind of violence and that kind of oppression. What I think the response in much of the anti-mafia community has been has been an effort to sort of tell their story, to tell of the experience of what the mafia had done 
done to their culture, what it had taken from their people. And to build up these heroes who, um, you know, really had become unifying figures. And so you're right, you've seen these incredible, these incredible stories um, of people like, you know, if you, if you watch, for instance, The Hundred Steps, the story of Pepino and Pastado, is this great anti-mafia activist, or The Traitor, which was uh, a 2018 film that came out um, about Tomaso Bouchette, a phenomenal film, recommended to anybody. Um, there's been this sort of artistic grappling with the legacy of the trauma that I think this place has experienced. And because the United States has never had to experience that at the hands of the mafia, in spite of the fact that there was real fear of organized crime in the United States in the 1960s and 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, and even 80s, there was never quite that level of trauma. The other thing I think is really important um, is that I think the development of the sort of mafia genre in the US emerged as something that sort of developed a narrative structure around the idea of these sort of um, criminal groups that engaged in bad behavior. We all know that, you know, members of the Godfather were violent, right? Like members of, if you look at Goodfellas, it's not like these are guys that you want to, you know, go have watch your children or something like that. We can tell they're doing bad things. But in the films, the way they're portrayed, they seem to sort of follow a certain set of rules and their violence is sort of cabined, right? You don't, there's a sense when you watch The Godfather that if you don't wander into that world, it, it doesn't really touch you. It's something separate. It's its own sort of self-regulated violence. And there's an allure to these figures within the criminal world that function as leaders, I guess, operating by a code that their their use of violence within the structure of their own world sort of makes sense. There's a sort of use, there's almost rules to the violence. If somebody gets killed in a mafia movie, you know why. There's a sense that by the by the rules of the game that they're playing, that guy had it coming. He, you know, was being killed because he violated the rules of the criminal game, right? Like that's a comforting way to think about criminal violence. I think that that sort of illusion is broken in a place like Sicily, where you know that the mafia killed children and dissolved their bodies in acid because that happened. Um, you know that the mafia was willing to shoot women in their cars. You know that the mafia was willing to target prosecutors and judges and police officers and people who had done absolutely nothing to them. So that idea of violence as cabin to a distinct world as operating by a sort of code, uh, by as being regulated by these disciplined um, figures from another age, which I think is sort of how you think of somebody like Avito Corleone or Michael Corleone. I don't think that that works as well in Italy. And I think it's not having had the same experience we in the U.S., don't tend to reflect on that as much. And the unfortunate thing is, is that we allow the development of, a, of, a, of an image of the Italian American mafioso that pervades a global perception of what it is, unfortunately, to be Sicilian, to be uh, Italian and to be Italian American that is both inaccurate and um, I, I think deeply harmful. Oh yeah, um, no, my, my observation is that <clears throat> I think um, the romanticization of the mafia in American popular culture stems from, I think, the the deeply held notion of the American dream, which I think is, you know, very much legitimate. Um, you know, mob organizations are tend, tend to be made up by immigrants, whether you think of Italians or Jewish or Chinese Americans. And um, mm -hmm. uh, these organizations are made up of people who, came to Italy with nothing and uh, for, to came to America, sorry, uh, with nothing. And they are all, all, they are almost constantly discriminated against and they have strong social ties. And, and so mm -hmm. they've made themselves successful, I guess, in spite of, or even perhaps because of these elements. And uh, uh, of course it, it reflects a dark side of uh, the, our way of looking at the American dream, but uh, it is still nonetheless the American dream. 
Um, so um, going to another topic, uh, you mentioned in the Quillette article that um, there was an organization um, that was founded by a, uh, a, I'm guessing a Catholic priest, uh, Giuseppe Pino Puglisi in 1990 mm -hmm. to provide after, after school programming to young people in the mafia neighborhood of Brancaccio. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, violence was visited on the uh, dear Padre by the Cosa Nostra in 93. Right. Um, and so I wonder uh, to what extent is the uh, Catholic Church or even local Catholics were involved in the fight against the mob? And uh, this is something that uh, has some personal resonance to me because I myself am a Catholic. And I know that, you know, Catholic Catholics have uh, they value the confession they take the confession very seriously and so hypothetically yeah. if uh, say a mob boss or a mob hitman goes to the goes to the father to confess his uh, crimes um, does, do they do the priests uh, are, are they visited by say law enforcement in order to disclose what that is and if so what do they do yeah. Um, so once again, you could write a book on the relationship between the Catholic Church and the mafia. It's a, an incredibly complex, um, multifaceted relationship. So on the one hand, um, members of the mafia historically really tried to portray themselves as religious. You have to think these were men who within their local communities wanted to be held uh, hold places of prestige, be seen as, again, men of honor. This is what they call themselves. And part of what that involved was portraying an image of religiosity. Of course, I'm sure many of them genuinely saw themselves as religious. Um, Bernardo Provenzano, who was one of the more recent bosses of Cosa Nostra, is known for having been quite devout, despite murdering lots of people. Um, but... Uh, Catholic images come up in mafia ceremonies and for instance in recruiting uh, in initiation rites the burning of the image of a saint is part of the um, part of the uh, famous Cosa Nostra initiation rite uh, but even in terms of things like funding the building of churches funding sort of maybe the local saints holiday this would have been something a mafia boss would have done to improve his prestige in the community um, so there was, in some sense, a sort of mafia attempt to, um, I don't want to say it, not co-opt the church, but co-opt the image of the Catholic church. And there were times when the Catholic church did not do enough, when they downplayed this threat. Um, to your point, um, there would have been priests who would have been close to certain members of the mafia, um, who would have had very, very close relationships with them. Um and benefited from those relationships. At the same time, the Catholic Church has also played a major and profoundly important role in resisting the mafia. So one of the most significant moments uh, in the anti-mafia movement was when Pope John Paul II um, publicly condemned the mafia. It was the first, uh, first time, I, I believe, yeah, that was the first time that a Catholic Pope had publicly spoken of and condemned the mafia and called on members of the mafia, this is significant, to convert to the Catholic church, saying they were outside of Catholicism. So I know that you'll understand how significant that that, that was, but to the mafia it was a real blow to their sort of prestige and, and claiming of a sense of any moral status. Um, of course, you had very courageous priests who stood up to the mafia, who tried to resist, who tried to protect people within their communities. Pino Puglisi, who you mentioned, is a, a great example. Um, if you go to the Cathedral of Palermo, you will find his tomb there. He is, in fact, uh, blessed Pino Puglisi. So he's on his way to sainthood within the Catholic Church, the first Catholic martyr to the mafia. There's uh, another one, Rosario Livatino, who a, uh, was a judge was um, also on this path. So we now, we now have two. Um, so the Catholic church has also at various points taken, you know, real concrete moral action to stand up to the mafia, which is important in a context like Sicily. Um, in terms of the confessional, so I, I will be upfront that I'm not sure exactly where the, what the line is on this in Italian law. 
Um, I believe that it sort of depends on the context in which the police, uh, the excuse me, in which the priest is going to the mafioso. So that if a mafioso were to go to church and confess like anyone else, the priest isn't necessarily going to be targeted. But if they're in a more sort of cooperative, beneficial relationship with the mafioso, that would that would look different. But again, I I don't want to speak to the exact legal contours because I'm not totally sure where that line gets drawn in Italian law. I see. Okay, so uh, a few final questions. So when, let's say I do come to Sicily in uh, probably this summer or in the coming future, um, to what extent is, uh, I guess, discussions about uh, the mafia or the anti-mafia crusade still occurs? Like to what extent is that a part of the ordinary Sicilians' lives. So that's um, one of the, I guess, sort of beautiful changes that has emerged in Sicily in the last 30 years. Um, I, I guess I should be upfront that I was not personally in Sicily 30 years ago, but <laughs> from speaking to those who have been there for having studied this, that um, it wouldn't have been so easy 30 years ago when Falcone and Borsellino were around, for instance, to um, find public commemoration and conversation around the mafia. This has changed. So if you went to Palermo, and by the way, I highly recommend to anybody who is interested to, if you at all can, to go to Sicily. It's a, it's a wonderful place. It's a beautiful culture. There's many lovely cities, incredible art and architecture, and um, the food is beyond compare. So highly recommend going and visiting Sicily. It's a wonderful place to spend a summer uh, or early fall or spring, really whenever. Um, but now if you go to Sicily, you will have the opportunity to find lots of ways to learn about the mafia, to engage in conversation on Dancy Mafia movement. So for instance, in um, Palermo, there is now the No Mafia Museum, um, which is right in the central, of the right in the center of the historic district. Um, and open to the public. There, if you go to Corleone, the town of, of Corleone, which um, is where that particularly violent faction I spoke about came from, there is a beautiful, truly moving museum uh, to the anti-mafia movement uh, in which people speak about their own experiences, having lived in the town that's most closely associated with the mafia. You can also see the documents of the great trial, the great maxi trial that Falcone and Borsellino led, which are housed in Corleone. Um, there are also tour groups that do specifically anti-mafia tourism. So um, again, Adio Pizzo is the group I was involved with. They have, uh, there's a separate organization a separate but related organization called Adio Pizzo Travel, and they will do mafia, anti-mafia tours around Palermo. Um, so they'll take you to main sites in the city and, and um, show you some of these sites, show, tell you about the mafia from a specifically anti-mafia perspective. And these are conversations that occur openly um, and are certainly uh, you know, there, there are certainly conversations that are being had and that you as a tourist could come and have the opportunity to learn about this story from Sicilians who are still engaged deeply in this work. Mm -hmm. So final question, because uh, the title of the Colette piece is called Honorable Men, and it's based on the term men of honor that you know, mafia organization members give themselves. And uh, of course, uh, once you've read the piece, you find out that the true men of honor are those who stood up against them and to one extent or another, not, you know, those, not the mobsters themselves. And, um, you know, this has, uh, to draw some parallels, this has uh, close resonance with uh, my own background, or at least my country's background, because um, as of right now, when you visit Hanoi, every street is named after someone who has contributed to the communist cause. Um, who have even martyred by it. Um, you know, some have gained you know, powerful leadership positions, uh, but um, little or nothing was said about those who uh, opposed communism. Um, the South of Vietnam were basically a footnote in you know, our uh, public school system's history books. And if, if they are mentioned, they would be mentioned in a very, very disdaining and contemptuous light. And so perhaps uh, with that 
background in mind, um, I would like to hear your thoughts on that term, man of honor, and how you view these actual, you know, men of honor. Wow, I mean, uh, you've really given me something to think about as well with with that story. Um, you know about Vietnam because, um, I mean, I think it really says a lot about how we sort of publicly speak uh, of individuals, how we kind of recall our history and how the the way in which our sort of public conversations around commemoration really do have an impact on how we, how we view the world, how we understand history. Um, so I guess, I guess for me, there is something significant in this concept of honor, right? We think about it, in terms of representing a certain type of comportment, a certain type of behavior to say that I am honorable, I, I behave with a certain code of honor. But it also is, it says something about how society sees us, uh, the way in which the, the lens through which the broader society understands, I suppose, what it values in some sense, that what it chooses to honor. Um, and what I think is so striking about the Sicilian experience on this front is that the last 30 years have really, it, it, and again, this project is not complete. It's not, I, I don't wanna make it sound like it's something rosy or, or like it's something that's been completely figured out or that there aren't still many significant challenges on this front. But one thing that I think has been quite important is that the Sicilian population has really taken uh, great steps to hold up and to honor the anti-mafia movement. You will find in many Sicilian towns um, streets named after Falcone, Borsellino, Dalla Chiesa, La Torre, all of these people, all of these great anti-mafia figures, you will find them represented, you will find monuments to them, you will find murals of them, you will find schools and gardens um, and parks named after them. And it's a public recognition of the immense value of what they've given. Uh, it's a holding them up as heroes and as models for the next generation to aspire to. And I think that the immense honor in that um, is merited. And I think it really needs to, you know, it, it stands in sharp contrast to the behavior of the so-called men of honor who brought down their society, who took from it, who extorted, um, and, you know, wrongfully appropriated this title of honor. Um, and I think it's right to see that reapplied to men and women who genuinely have merited it. Yeah. Yeah, with that being said, yeah, thank you very much, Mara Kremen, for being on this program. Thank you for your uh, well-researched and thoughtful insights into uh, the Italian anti-mafia fight. And, you know, um, yeah, I stumbled upon your article while I was reading Colette, and uh, I've uh, invited many people who have uh, had their pieces published on Colette before on this show, and I must say that yeah, I always find something interesting and thoughtful on that particular website, and I would recommend that to everyone, and in particular, your uh, long essay on the anti-mafia fight. So um, thank you for that piece, and uh, I hope you uh, take care of yourself, and I wish you the best of luck with your future endeavors. Thank you, and same to you, and thank you very much for your incredibly insightful questions and for giving me the chance to, to speak about this to more people. Um, I, I hope many more people are able to learn about the story of Falcone and Borsellino and the anti-mafia movement, and I, I'm really grateful to you for giving me the chance to hopefully share that with a, with a uh, wider audience. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right, bye now.